I've been playing Tokimeki Memorial lately. It's this really influential dating sim from 1994. I learned about it from this six hour Tim Rogers video dissecting the game and it immediately got me interested and ready to play. Unfortunately, there was no translation, official or otherwise, so I couldn't play it. Until March of 2022, when God himself descended from heaven and threw a Super Famicom cartridge through my window and I was finally able to enjoy it. And enjoy it, I did. So much so that I thought, hey, I should play Tokimeki Memorial. Too. Just one problem, that game was also Japan exclusive, and God never threw that cartridge into my home because it's a PS1 game that uses discs. This means that the game is stuck in Japanese. I can't play it. And it got me thinking, there are a lot of games that, for whatever reason, I can't play. Obviously, if I can't play a game, I can't really do a comprehensive review or retrospective about it like I normally would. But I still think a lot of these are worth discussing. If nothing else, I'd like to shine a light on how some potentially important important parts of gaming history can be lost to the void. But first, let's set some ground rules. There's a lot of different reasons why a game might be off limits to me, so we'll be dividing these into categories, the first one being games that lack translations. My first big note for this category is that fan translations do count. Like, legally you can't play Mother 3 in English, but if you do, I ain't gonna tell nobody. At least Tokimeki Memorial is covered though, right? John, what gives? You just said you were playing the game with the girls in English, and now you're talking about how you can't play it? Are you dumb? Allow me me to explain. I've played Tokimeki Memorial beneath the Tree of Legend for the Super Famicom. I did not play the original Tokimeki Memorial for the PC Engine CD, nor did I play Tokimeki Memorial Forever With You for the PS1, Sega Saturn, or Windows 95. While these are all fundamentally the same game, I think there are enough differences for them to qualify as separate experiences. The original 1994 version of the game features full voice acting that changes depending on what each girl thinks of you. This provides another layer of gameplay, in addition to the dialogue and facial expressions. This can save you from nasty rumors if one of the girls doesn't like you. Forever With You was an updated version of the original that enhances the graphics, adds an anime opening, and apparently some other things, like new minigames. I'm going off Wikipedia here because remember, I can't play it. The version that I played, Beneath the Tree of Legend, cuts a lot of the content, including the opening videos and the voice acting, as well as reducing the graphical fidelity. Kotaku published an article about the fan translation where Rogers himself talks about how the exclusions in the Super Famicom version diminish the overall experience. In his own words, Playing Tokimeki Memorial for Super Famicom before playing it for Sony PlayStation, Sega Saturn, Windows, or PC Engine would be like watching a movie for the first time with the TV muted and two lines of subtitles displaying both the movie's dialogue and the director's commentary. It's not a full film. It's a DVD bonus feature you throw on while waiting for your laundry to finish, while also waiting for an important phone call. Damn! So why did this appear? apparently inferior version get the translation. I've heard numerous references to the other version's spaghetti code, making it infamously difficult to work with. Maybe the Super Famicom version was just easier? I don't know. To be clear, the folks who worked on the translation of this version were no slackers, using some form of black magic to add elements of the original back in, like the opening, vocal songs, and even voice acted endings. They even managed to speed the scrolling checkerboard back up to 60 frames per second! Yeah! The voice acting is missing from the rest of the game, and I've heard rumblings that some some of the under the hood mechanics are different, but I'd say it bridges the gap pretty well. While we're on the subject, I also can't play the two Game Boy Color versions of this game. So, if you're keeping track at home, we have the original PC Engine version, the updated re-release for PS1, Sega Saturn, and Windows 95, the downgraded Super Famicom port, the fan translated and slightly upgraded version of the downgraded Super Famicom port, a couple mobile ports, two PSP versions, as well as, finally, two Game Boy Color ports. They split the girls up into versions exclusives like they were Pokemon! <sighs> Oh, uh, by the way, Tokimeki 2 is a five-disc behemoth which adds the emotional voice system. This would allow the characters to say your name, which probably makes the game even harder to translate. I will never be able to marvel at the wonders of technology as I stare lovingly into the eyes of its greatest achievement, Hikari Hinamoto. <coughs> I mean, it makes sense why these games aren't often translated. It's a visual novel. <laughs> They're just books with anime girls slapped on top. Kimiga Nozomu A 
Alien is another example that haunts me. It's a visual novel that was adapted into an anime more commonly known in America as Rumbling Hearts. I'd tell you about it, but almost every detail is a spoiler, so I'll leave it at this thing gets sad real quick. I watched it back in high school and it was a roller coaster, so naturally I wanted to try the original VN. But alas, there is no translation yet. One has been in development since at least 2015, starting as a fan project by Enjoy Evan, who was later hired as lead translator for the spin-off series, Muff Love. In October 2019, it was confirmed that a remake of the original would be made, which would apparently tie it more into Muff Love. A localization was later confirmed with Enjoy Evan's involvement, which was great, until a few months later when he confirmed that he'd parted ways with the company and would no longer be working on the project. News has been sparse since then. The last reference to it I can find is a December 2021 interview with Kazutochi Matsumura, the executive brand producer for Anchor, the current rights holder for the game. He says that it's still planned for release, but that other installments of Muv Love will be taking precedence. Considering it's already been seven years, I'm not gonna hold my breath for this one. Super Adventure Rockman is a pretty infamous Mega Man title for the PS1 and Sega Saturn. It's sort of like an interactive anime. The plot is mostly basic Mega Man stuff. Dr. Wily finds an ancient supercomputer, he brings back old robot masters, you bring back old robot masters, and he puts Roll in a coma. Do you think she's, uh, do you think she's gonna make it out yeah, of this? Yeah, yeah, she'll be fine. I know, I know you really think so. Yeah, she's, uh, you know. She's strong. She owes me $20. A robot coma. The reason for the game's infamy has to do with its particularly gruesome cutscenes. Mega Man creator Keiji and Afune expressed disapproval with them, stating, The ultimate unspoken rule about making a game that is geared towards children is that you simply cannot kill anyone. But here, you have military helicopters falling out of the sky and people dying in droves. If it had been up to me, I would have at least made it so they all got away safely via parachutes or some Something. Then, as if that wasn't bad enough, Roll dies. And to top it all off, the whole world is destroyed. I was like, did they really need to go that far? He doesn't even include the part where the supercomputer electrocutes all of the heroes on screen. Good old classic Mega Man fun. This might be why the game never received a release outside of Japan. People have translated basically all the cutscenes on YouTube, but the game doesn't have a subtitle option, making it difficult to add the translation to the ROM itself. So you can watch Super Adventure Rockman, but you can't really play it. You can look up a translation guide, so maybe you can get through it that way? But does that really qualify as playing the game? It's pretty minimalistic, so it's not like you're getting the full experience. It's sort of similar to the Tokimeki Memorial question, in that you can sort of play the game. Speaking of Mega Man, his PS1 racing title, Mega Man Battle and Chase, is sort of an interesting example. This one did get an English translation, which came out in Europe and later saw an American release as a part of the Mega Man X collection on PS2 and GameCube. But for whatever reason, there's some content missing. In the Japanese version of the game, there are some new robot characters named Chest, Plum, and Rip It. Chest tells you about the game's courses and the additional car parts, and Plum interviews your character before the race, as well as joining Rip It to give commentary during the race. Basically, all of this is scrubbed out of the English version for some indiscernible reason. Were they just lazy? Also, more importantly, the European version removes the memory card animation, ruining the game. I can play this game, but not all of this game. I guess all the interactive stuff is there. Does this count? At what point do regional differences mean a game is fundamentally different enough to not be playable in its original form? Food for thought. Also, they changed the biohazard sign, so it says Resident Evil. I am speaking directly into your ear now. So a language barrier might be one thing keeping you from your sweet sweet, sweet gaming, but it's not the only kind of obstacle you might face. What if a game is prohibitively expensive or otherwise impractical to play? This is where we get a lot more into the weeds about what qualifies and what doesn't. Let's just jump right into it. Leave a like, leave a subscribe, leave a comment, leave a dead body on my front porch. For example, the original Monkey Ball arcade game may be playable through emulation or ROM hacks, but you can't emulate the banana joystick. This poses a question about the integrity of the game. Monkey Ball's original arcade iteration had its level recycled for the GameCube game, so it kind of makes one wonder what the point of playing it is at all. And I do think the novelty of that banana joystick is genuinely one of the biggest factors. I'm dying on this hill. Similarly, Super Monkey Ball Ticket Blitz is never going to feel quite right unless you own a trackball. Do you own a trackball? I didn't think so. I can't play the King James Bible. It's not a video game.
Um... Another game I can't play is the violin. Not only is it not a game, but I don't know how to play that instrument. It's hard. Another example of this is the Sega Sonic Popcorn Shop. It's half game, half popcorn machine, and to my knowledge, you can't download any programs for your PC that can accurately mimic the most important function of a popcorn machine. To be fair though, it's not like the gameplay is exactly very deep. First, you pick a popcorn flavor. According to this arcade flyer, your options are buttered, salted, or chili sauce. I don't know who decided to make butter and salt separate flavors, but I hope they're currently rotting in hell, where they belong. Then you turn this crank to help Sonic get away from Dr. Eggman and his sexy, sexy legs. I was gonna do a visual gag here, but like, look at this. Now it's time to make the popcorn. Your trusty crank helps Sonic stir the kernels. He's not actually stirring it though. It's a video game. Turns out you don't even need to touch the crank. You can take your entire hand off of it and apparently the crank will just turn by itself. So that entire piece of gameplay is just a ruse, a lie, and it's one of only three actions we've performed. If the crank fails to turn, however, you get an error screen where the in-game popcorn factory explodes while Sonic tells you to ask for assistance. Does having to talk to an underpaid arcade employee so that they can fix the popcorn machine qualify as gameplay? This has to have been terrifying for any child who saw it too. You thought your hardest challenge was going to be choosing between salt and butter and now everything's exploding? This would have viscerally upset me as a five year old. That's all I'm gonna say. Like Monkey Ball, you can technically emulate this game, but you can't emulate the crank nor the popcorn machine contained within. I guess you can make popcorn while emulating it, if that makes you feel something, but you'll never truly experience receiving bad popcorn in a dirty arcade. You know what else you can't emulate? Fire! <laughs> Disclaimer, Johnny does not condone the use of fire when playing rhythm games from the early 2000s. Please do not set your house on fire, and moreover, please do not sue Johnny. I'm kind of broke right now, not gonna lie. Dance Dance Emulation is, I guess, a mod slash performance piece based off of the Dance Dance Revolution franchise. I made a video about it back in the old days. But would you still love it if you got blasted with flames for being a horrible gamer? Believe it or not, there's a modified version where you do. It was created by an artist collective called Interpretive Arson, and it debuted at the Crucible's Fire Arts Festival in 2005. It would go on to show up at Burning Man and many other festivals in California, and even one in Denmark for the next eight years. It made its last appearance at 2013's Burning Man, after which all the components were piled up before having a piano dropped on them. In case it's not clear by now, DDI is DDR, but with fire. If you do well, you get to watch fire shoot into the air. Hooray! But if you do bad, oh, oh. <laughs> Luckily, all the participants wore fire proximity suits, just like firefighters. There's an interview with some of the creators on YouTube, and it's a short but interesting watch. Apparently, they got a grant to help fund the project, and half of the money was delivered in pennies. They also showed off the rules for DDI with a helpful sign. Number one, convince us you're at least 18. And no, not that way. Number two, can you balance on one foot and pat your head while rubbing your tummy? No, neither can we. Please just don't be pissed. Drunk. Can I play my favorite DDR song? We've tried our best to include everything. What you see is what you get. Oh yo, so the fire thing isn't the only mod involved. I wonder if they used a real DDR machine and modded it out. Maybe they used Step Mania? That came out in 2001, so it lines up. Anyways, because of that damn piano, I'll never get to experience a hot blast of flames to the face every time I fail Butterfly within 12 seconds, and that pains me in my soul. Some games are still playable, but individual parts of them are lost. The Rock Band series has some DLC that can't be purchased anymore due to licensing issues. The biggest example of this is the Rock Band Network. This was a service where artists could use a modified version of Reaper to chart their own music for Rock Band, making a cut of the profits after the songs passed a peer reviewing process. The service shut down in 2014, but left the 2,121 existing RBN songs up and available for purchase. Unfortunately, they were all delisted in 2018, so unless you already own them, your living room house parties will no longer be soundtracked by Brentel Floss, Jonathan Colton, and Lemon Demon, provided you're still having rock band house parties. If you do still have a plastic Stratocaster in your house, you're not totally out of luck. A handful of the most popular RBN songs were brought over to Rock Band 4 as DLC, and those are still up. All of them have also been added to Clone Hero, but in their original rock band form with all the rock band animations and rock band engine and aesthetics, gone. The same thing can be said for Guitar Hero Live's GHTV. GHTV was a mode where you could play songs 
with music videos or live performances in the background, instead of the usual FMVs recorded for the game. These were streamed over the internet, rather than being on disc or downloads. The tracks were separated into channels based on genre, which cycled out every 24 hours. You could also use Robux to play any song that wasn't in current rotation, so if you really wanted playing Jesse's Girl to be part of your daily routine, like, sure. There was also a party pass you could buy to give yourself access to everything for a limited time in case you had some friends over or something. It doesn't seem like there was a way to permanently purchase any of the songs, though, and because of the nature of the service, none of these are available to be played since it shut down in 2018. 2018 apparently was the year it all went down. Say goodbye to ever being able to play Weezer songs on your Wii U. Those days are long gone. Luckily, these songs are also archived for Clone Hero, complete with support for the ugly six-fretted guitar. But again, if you can't do it on the Wii U, what's the point? Puyo Puyo Fever Carnival Edition is another interesting case. Information is really sparse, but according to Puyo Nexus, Carnival Edition was a free-to-play version of Puyo Fever released for the franchise's 15th anniversary on PC. Between March and December of 2006, a new character would be available to play against every month, with Puyo merchandise apparently serving as a prize. These characters were from other Sega games, like Sonic decked out in his rider's gear, Ai Ai sporting his new Banana Blitz design, and even Kokiri Chozu, a random Japanese comedian for some reason. I'm unclear why exactly the game can't be played in its original form, but the exclusive characters have been restored to the PC version of the game in mod form. Even with these characters making their return, we don't have online matches or potential to win Poyo merch anymore. I can play, but I can't play for the Poyo body pillow! What if entire games go missing and we can't experience them in any form, save for whatever screenshots and videos still survive? That's right, it's time to talk about mobile games, the video game equivalent of circus peanuts. A lot of these were only distributed digitally on now obsolete hardware before game preservation was really a thing. Couple this with the fact that mobile games aren't typically thought of as high art and you have a lost media landfill on your hands. I can't possibly hit on all of these, so I'll briefly touch on a few of interest, like the unfathomable number of Sega mobile games from the 2000s. First up, we have Sonic Cafe, a mobile portal which lasted from 2001 to 2007. As the name implies, this was where Sonic Team's content went, not only including games involving the blue blur, but also the company's other franchises like Choo Choo Rocket, Samba de Amigo, and Puyo Puyo. We only have titles for a lot of these, so Choo Choo Edit and Puyo Puyo DX Christmas version will forever remain a mystery. Some of these seem to be ports like Fantasy Star and Tranquilizer Gun. There are surviving screenshots from some games, so we can see the progression from 2001's primitive version of Sonic 1 to 2006's comparatively more advanced, but probably still primitive version of Sonic 2. Sonic 2 also has this gross new logo. Ugh. I can't imagine that some of these, like Knights for example, are straight ports, but I guess I'll never know. A lot of these games are totally original ideas using existing Sega characters. And by totally original, I mean Sonic Golf and Sonic Fishing. And wow, we should sure do have a whole lot of images of all these Sonic ones and a whole lot of nothing for Billy Hatcher Hypershoot. Where are the screenshots? So yeah, unless you manage to find an ancient Japanese cell phone that already has one of these downloaded, you'll never be able to play Sonic Hopping or its long-awaited sequel, Sonic Hopping 2. The same can be said for Ulala no Channel J, a Space Channel 5 themed portal launched for JSky phones in 2001 before merging with Sonic Cafe in 2004. Twitter user Marie Robbie actually did did manage to dig up a phone that still had this loaded onto it, which means we can still admire low frame rate ooh-la-la walking across an early 2000s flip phone display, not to mention this fire beat. I'm probably never going to play any of these mini games, but at least I can enjoy the commercial and the print ads. This is just about the coolest image ever crafted by man. Ice cold. Fellas, what's cooler than being cool? Having a mobile phone with ooh la la from the Sega video game Space Channel 5 on it so you can watch it walk across the screen! Sega Ages was an existing brand used for re-releases of older games to home consoles, so the mobile portal established in 2001 carried on that tradition. 
Notably, compile-era Puyo games like 2, Sun, and Nazo Puyo 2 are included here, even though newer Puyo titles are grouped under Sonic Cafe. All of these services were eventually merged into one portal called Puyo Puyo Sega in 2007, which, despite the name, contains more than Puyo games, including its predecessor, Madao Monogatari. Monogatari? Some of the later titles released for this service are still up. I can and have played Super Monkey Ball 2 Sakura Edition. Isn't that great? Isn't it? There are also, of course, plenty of Puyo games, including Puyo Puyo Fever, Mina de Nazo Puyo, which kind of just sounds like they took the three most random Puyo titles they could think of and smashed the names together. It came out in 2013 as well. They were all 10 years old by that point. What were they doing? My friends Cardino and Pixel Pursuit did a great video where they somehow managed to dig up a few old Monkey Ball games. I don't think those are publicly available at the moment, but you can at least see them in motion, which is more than I can say for Billy Hatcher Hypershoot, god damn it! Finally, we have canceled games, which no one has ever been able to play. There's an immeasurable amount of these, some of which have leaked and therefore don't qualify, but I want to focus on two particularly infamous Mario games. First up is Super Mario 64 2, a Nintendo 64 disk drive game we only know about because of a handful of Miyamoto interviews and magazine articles. Allow me to synthesize all the information I can find into a digestible haha -ha funny format for you. Let's just peruse the technically three paragraph long page on Mario Wiki. Hmm. Apparently the game was going to bring back some scrapped elements from the original Mario 64, like a rideable Yoshi and multiplayer featuring Luigi. In fact, the first playable level was multiplayer, so that was clearly a priority. That's, uh, that, that's about it. It's not known for sure how far into development the game got, but there is a later Miyamoto interview from 2006 where he's asked about it and he like straight up doesn't even remember it, so probably not very far. No screenshots or videos either, so I guess you're gonna have to use your imagination. A weird disk drive version of the original Mario 64 leaked in 2014, and according to Mario Wiki, it's been theorized that this was a version of Mario 64 too, but like, come on. This is the original game. If this was at any point intended to be related to Mario 64 too, then it is the earliest version imaginable. And of course, I can't talk about Mario 64 too without talking about Super Mario 128. That's two 64s put together. Super Mario 128 was a tech demo for the GameCube shown at Space World 2000. While this was little more than 128 Marios walking around while the terrain shifted in various ways, it sparked the imaginations of Nintendo fans for years to come. It's always been sort of foggy if this was supposed to be a proper game or not. Yoshiaki Koizumi, who directed it, as well as Mario Sunshine, said during an Awada Asks interview that he'd wanted to turn it into a full project, but that it would have been close to impossible. He wanted the terrain Mario walked on to be less of a weird saucer shape and more of a sphere, but putting all those Marios on there would basically melt your GameCube. Miyamoto, on the other hand, was quoted by IGN as saying that the game was in development and would, quote, feature the newness missing from Mario Sunshine. He reiterated that the game was in development in 2004, although he specified that Super Mario 128 was a working title. The game, at this point, was apparently in experimental stages and couldn't be shown publicly. Sounds more like he was making Frankenstein's monster, if I'm being honest. In 2005, then-president of Nintendo of America, Reggie fils said that a video of the game would probably be shown at E3 that year. This would have been the first time the game had been publicly seen in five years, if he'd actually been telling the truth. Finally, in 2006, Miyamoto referred to the game as a test concept, and said that some elements of it made their way into Super Mario Galaxy, such as that whole walking around a sphere thing they seem to be having so much trouble with. Most famously, in 2007, when delivering his keynote speech at GDC, Miyamoto reiterated this while also adding that Galaxy wasn't the only game to carry 128's torch. The purpose of that demo was to show how the new technology in the GameCube could dynamically change the nature of Mario games. So when people ask me what happened to it, I'm always at a loss as to how to answer it because most of you have already played it. But you played it in a game called Pikmin. This game featured one element of Mario 128 that allowed a large number of characters to operate independently and as a group. It's advanced AI. But of course, if I was to tell you all that this is what happened to Mario 128, you'd all be pretty angry. So, is this a game I can't play? Or is it a tech demo? Or is it Pikmin? Or is it Mario Galaxy? Um, 
Am I real? Obviously, I couldn't cover every game, but I'm looking forward to learning about more after I get a chance to read the comments on this video. For now, though, I've got to get ready for bed. I'll be crying myself to sleep so I can dream about the sweet delights of the Sega Sonic popcorn shop, as I do every night. I hope all of you do the same. Peace. Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video. Right before I uploaded this, I actually opened the Patreon. You can support me there at the $1 tier to get access to monthly commentaries and some other behind the scenes stuff. There's a commentary of the Super Monkey Ball 1 video up now. If you support at $3, I'll even verbally shout you out. Like bow ties and glasses and Bam Bam Dabuha, who supported at the $3 level. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you support at the $1 tier, you get your names on the screen like this. Okay, bye.